Alright, uh, if you could just stand. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Everybody kind of shake their hands out. A little stretching. You're going to need it. You know what I mean in a minute. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm going to stand here. I'm going to tell a few jokes until we get our full uh, worship team and everybody ready. <laughs> Alright, we're going to start with a song called Greater. We've done it a couple times. It's been a while. But uh, take a deep breath. Alright?
Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart and it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. Gracious Holy Father, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you and praise you, Lord, this morning for bringing us together to fellowship and to worship and to learn your word. I just ask uh, this morning that whoever's here, will you just open their hearts, open our minds, Lord, this morning for what you have for us to take away today to use for your glory this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you can be seated. Thank you guys so much for doing that. That first song that we did, Greater, I just wanted them to make that a little bit faster the next time that we do. So the 1030 service, I'll have them pick it up just a little bit more. It's one of my favorite songs, and it works so well with what we're going over today. All right, so a couple things. We moved communion from today until March the 14th. We just had some schedule adjustments we needed to make, and so communion uh, for both 9 o'clock and 1030 will be on March the 14th, and Philip and I will be doing that uh, tandem tag team together. A uh, new small group in Warrington begins on March 11th at the Young Hands Home. If you're interested, uh, they live right by the Outback. If you're interested in that, that'll be starting March 11th. They're going to be going every other week. And then I want to challenge you with uh, helping me out with something for a Marshall small group. Currently leading three or four different groups throughout the week. We do need a Marshall group to get kicked off again. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. I, I may be able to do it, but for the time being, I'd love for somebody else to consider uh, possibly hosting and leading that, and uh, we'll, we'll just take it from there. So if you're interested in that, you just let me know. Wave your arm around. Uh, I'm grateful for the Freemans and the Summerals. They've got the Hume group that occasionally then goes down to the Amosville group once a month down to Joe and Irene's, and then back up to Hume again. And we've got six or seven other groups that are leading as well. So think about that and uh, let me know. So new group in Warrington, March 11th. We do need a new Marshall group to start off. And then we've got several others meeting in the area as well. Pray for uh, missions stuff that's going on. Uh, Mel Snow is in Ethiopia right now getting uh, the first real a uh, missionary team member that is now fully supported on their staff uh, on the ground and going. Um, she's real excited to be there, and you can just continue to, to pray for them as a crew. Uh, Mel will be back relatively shortly, but uh, continue to lift them up for Be There Ministries. Also, for the Stevensons in France and several of our others in Slovakia and other places around the globe that are still in lockdown, uh, the Zagadars in the UK still really, really struggling with making connections because uh, things are still in a tremendous lockdown case over there. So continue to pray for them. And finally, I'm going to bring Amy up to the front with me. Uh, listen, we're, we're trying to get creative with ways that we can all continue to grow and learn in a more uh, effective way and a, in a better equipping fashion. And so we partnered with a ministry called Right Now Ministries. Right Now Ministries has literally thousands of tools that are available for us. And so what we've done is we've made a connection with them as a church to cover everything. If you're maybe leading a small group and you're thinking, you know, I'd like to do something differently and I, I, I may not have the time because my work schedule changed. Oh, I can tap into Right Now Ministries because the church bought all the rights for that. And there's 600 different options that we can now choose to help with small groups. Or, you know, as a parent, I really would like a, a different focus and look at maybe how I can bring up my toddlers, where there's a whole series on that. Oh, I'm looking for church leadership, or I'm working, uh, you know, Wes is constantly looking at these scrapping young men to his left and thinking, I mean, my Lord, what am I going to do with these guys? And even a guy like Wes, he could go on and he could log in to say, how do I get my teenage boys on track? Now, fortunately, these guys are already on track, so you don't have to worry about that. That's really good. But if you need that kind of thing, we have it already there. 
The key is getting connected and signing up. So, Amy, how can we do that as a church right. moving forward? What does everybody need to consider? So, at noon today, you should receive in your email box, if we have your email address, you should receive an invitation to Right Now Media. So, that should be sent out. You should receive it by noon today. And just go ahead and follow the instructions on there. If you haven't received it, go ahead and email the church office, office at gbcmarshall.org. Let me know, and I can get an invitation sent out to you. So, Fantastic. Yeah. These guys are not going to ask you for money. They're not going to ask you for personal information. The email is the, is the tool or the conduit in order to access all of the thousands of bits of information. Uh, we've done tutorials with them recently. We've also gone through and looked at all of the different options that are there, and we really were impressed with the different opportunities that are available for us because we can't cover everything and all of the needs on a regular basis. You may have things that come up immediately that, that require immediate attention, and there may be something right there that can be helpful for you. This is also something that you can encourage maybe even a family member to be a part of as well. And we can get them connected to this. Exactly. I don't mean to interrupt, yeah, but right absolutely. Ahead. It is free to share with family members, people that you know, and it's completely free to them. Let us know their email address. We'll get an invitation sent out to them, and it's free. There's right. no charge. We're covering the all. cost yes. as a church for all of us and for folks that you are connected to. And again, we would appreciate not only you considering using the tool, but then giving us feedback on how uh, maybe easy the, nav the navigation was and how uh, effective in, uh, in helping. Uh, that, would be, uh, that would be a blessing. So, exactly. all right. Thanks. So, okay. noon today? Noon today. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Very, very much. All right. Most of you know that we have been going through a series on marriage and family. And uh, again, most have responded really, really well to this. Uh, we've had a few questions on why do you think that this is appropriate to do this kind of thing now? And my response has typically been, well, why not? I mean, with everything else going on in the world, we are challenged in our relationships across the board. So why not be diving into this sort of thing and making sure that God has our back and we understand what he's doing in and through our life. And so we're doing this marriage series covering various topics along the way because it's important whether we're in a pandemic or whether everything is going great that we have our connections in our relationships with our spouse and with our kids in full throttle. Now, from an individual family standpoint, yeah, this, this maybe makes sense to you, but what about what about a global standpoint? What about a national standpoint? We've got all kinds of things that are going on in our nation right now and all kinds of things going on in our own state right now that are trying to tell us that traditional understanding of marriage and males and females are just not right. There has to be umpteen numbers of genders and there has to be all different kinds of understandings of how marriage works. And I'm telling you right now that if we don't come to grips, that this is not political. This is called realville. What we're saying here about these kinds of items is not Democrat and Republican. This is Bible. And so maybe you're here this morning and uh, maybe you're or joining us online and you're thinking, well, I'm just sort of experimenting with this Christianity thing. And that sounds racist. That sounds bigoted. That sounds white supremacy oriented. Well, it's not. You and I are constantly, every day, being pummeled with garbage from the media trying to tell you and me how to think. And they're taking the narrative of Scripture that is so plain and so clear, and they're trying to drive a different narrative into our homes, which is separating husbands and wives, separating families, alienating kids from their parents, because they now are suddenly looking at a completely different worldview. And it's important for us to understand that topics like abortion, 
LGBTQ, traditional marriage, the black-white issue. If you talk too much about whiteness, then you're privileged. If you talk too much about blackness, then you're victimized. I was joking with Barb last night. There was a commercial on, and uh, we're just, it was on, it was Hallmark. It was, I think it was the Hallmark Channel. And it said, finally, a station just for us. And I'm like, wait a minute. And it was an all-black station. So wait a minute. Does that mean that if it's an all-white station, that that's a problem? Why do we do this kind of thing? Why do we polarize these issues? And we do the same thing when it comes to marriage and relationships. Because if we say, oh, marriage is one man and one woman. In other words, it's a male and a female. Well, then we're, we're bigoted and we're, we're racist. No, we're not. No, you're not. This is what the Bible stands for. This, this, is a, this is a stance on biblical scripture. And so for those of you who may be out there and you're thinking, well, I don't really buy into the Bible. We're not here to try to offend anybody. We're just simply trying to stand on the principles that we agree to abide by as a church. As people who call themselves Christians, this becomes the manual. If you still use these, most people are using their phones anymore for the Bible. And so we do in this series, in this understanding of, of marriage, because we understand that God has a plan for it. And we go to the Bible, and we look at the book of Genesis, and we look at the book of Ephesians to look at it. And then we look at the personalities that are involved. There's male and female, if you will, I'm going to stereotype a little bit. There's a, there's a little pink and blue action going on. And sometimes it's a challenge to kind of work with each other. Even the best of marriages have relationship challenges. Because anytime you bring one other person into the relationship, sparks happen. And by the grace of God, you're able to work through those things. And then we looked at some of the other aspects that affect us. So not only the plan and the personalities, but there are certain things that we, we wrestle with as we go through our relationship challenges. And you can see those. The issue of pain, and we looked at that a little bit last week, and how going through suffering as a couple is really, really challenging. And listen, all of these things that we talk about are biblically based and so when we refer to a marriage that exists between a husband and a wife, we're not being disparaging to other groups of people that exist within our culture. We're not saying, uh, you're a terrible person. We're not saying that if you choose that lifestyle, that we hate you. That's not what we're saying. But culture says, if you don't buy in and become all-inclusive to everybody and everything along the whole journey, then this is what you are. Do not listen to that stuff. And our young people are being just overrun by the pressures of this societal trap that has hit us. This, this distraction that is endeavoring to weave its way into our culture. And yet these things are biblical truths. Last week, we looked at this uh, aspect of, of suffering. And wait, if you could just go to that chart real quick for us. Look at those reviews up there. I mean, these are things, suffering's to be expected. God's in control. God's not allowed difficulties in our life that we can't handle. Pain and suffering can occur in our life without God's. None of it can occur without God's knowledge. And the primary goal is not necessarily relief, because relief doesn't come all the time. What happens when relief doesn't come? And so we looked at these things. God's plan for marriage. The personalities within marriage. Dealing with the, the struggles of pain. These are biblical principles that must interweave themselves into our life or we will not get it. We will let culture determine how we're supposed to feel and how we're supposed to think and what we're supposed to do. 
Well, there's a text we're going to look at this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. It's basically where the song Greater comes from. And John was thrown into a situation alongside of Jesus, and you're thinking, how, how is any of this going to have to do with marriage? Well, you're going to see. Because the principles that we're going to find from the Gospel of John are so pertinent, not only for the relationship that the two of them had, but for the relationships that we need to have, not only as individuals and our relationship with God, but our relationship with our spouse as well. John was commissioned way in advance, prophetically, years prior to his birth, that he would be the spokesperson for Jesus. He would come on the scene, he would share this gospel message, and he would literally lay the path out for Jesus to take over. You would think that that's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, but the transition for that to happen had a whole lot of humanness entering into the situation where pride could have stepped in and possibly thwarted the original design and plan that God had laid out. And, you know, that happens in our own lives and relationships as well. If you and I don't understand how personalities work, get the plan of God for understanding marriage and how that comes together, if we don't wrestle with and struggle with and work through together the issues of pain and suffering, well, I'm telling you right now, when pride comes into the relationship, if we, if we can't handle these other things, the pride thing is going to totally destroy us. Because the humanness factor wants to step in and build a wedge between husband and wife, between you and your kids. Wait, let's take a look at uh, some of these verses, beginning at verse 2, John chapter 3, and we'll unpack, starting in verses 22 and following, what God is saying here. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now listen, this is really important. After these things, most of you know John 3, what? John 3, 16. I mean, when you think of John chapter 3, you think John 3, 16, and you think of his interface with this guy, this lawyer, his name was Nicodemus. That's the most famous section of what's going on. But after these things... Jesus leaves the area of Jerusalem, and he goes over to the east side to the area of the Jordan. And it says, and they are baptizing. Now, from John chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says that Jesus himself wasn't baptizing, but he was there with his disciples, and he was just sort of accompanying them, and maybe he was teaching them, or maybe showing them how it was done. But the scripture said that the disciples were the ones that were pretty much involved with what was going on. Let's see what the next verse says. Now, John was also baptizing in a place called Anon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, this is interesting. Jesus is leaving Jerusalem heading east. John is just north of him in this place called Anon near Salem. Now, Anon is just a word that means a place of many waters. And wait, if you're able to, to take that map and, and give us a little bit of an idea of where this is. Jerusalem is down here, and Jesus is making his way up this way. John was over here. So they're in the relatively the same area, and they're, they're baptizing, and they're, they're talking about what it means to be followers of Christ. Uh, Jesus, of course, is bringing people to himself. Uh, John is pointing people to Christ. But he continues in the next couple of verses. If you could go back to verse 24. For John had not yet been thrown in prison. You can read about that when Herod just has had enough of him and is about ready to lop off his head. Continue on. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. You could read about that earlier in chapters 2 and chapters 3. Uh, the word dispute is... It's not just somebody going up, like me going up to Andy and saying, you know, Andy, I don't necessarily agree with the way that uh, maybe you put those uh, new lines in there for our internet service. I mean, maybe you could have done that a little bit better, and you could just maybe shrug your shoulders and say, tough apples, you don't know what you're doing anyway, and I've got this down. No, no problem, no biggie. 
This was a philosophical debate that was going on. There were issues theologically that they were, they were bantering. They were going back and forth. This was not just some casual, yeah, uh, no big deal. It was, no, we are, we're going we're gonna to wrestle with this because we think we're right. And he continues on, verse 26. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you've testified, behold, he's baptizing and everybody's coming to him. And we're going to park here for just a few minutes. This whole idea of pride, once it works its way into the relationship, is a tremendous, tremendous challenge. Because if we don't understand how to work through it, it will decimate our relationships. Now, I realize, those of you who are couples in here, you don't have any problem with this. You, you never put your feet down. You never put your feet in the concrete and say that it's my way or the highway. You've never had a knockdown, drag out in your family. And if you have, if you're the type of personality and you don't have a yelling type personality, you have a step back personality, you dig your heels in, all right? Maybe you just, you just don't say anything. You're, you're doing the same thing. You're just maybe not verbally expressing it as much. But there are things that you have looked at your spouse and you have said, really? You, you believe that? Or you did that? Or I can't believe you didn't acknowledge me in this way? I mean, what's wrong with you? Well, there are all kinds of distractions in life that will endeavor to take us away from our allegiance to Jesus, of course, and possibly allegiance to your spouse. And I don't know what those are like in your family, but in each couple, they probably look a little bit different. Some of these things are funny. We, we maybe can laugh about them. People laugh about uh, Barb and me in our, our walks in the snow. And I, I'm telling you, when winter comes, I, I'm like a different person. I'm crazy, okay? I mean, I, it's, it's almost idolatrous, okay? It, it's, it, I'm not kidding you. It's borderline. And you guys look at your life and you think, oh, yeah, I don't have any issues like that. Sure you don't. You just have issues about things that I wouldn't even dream about. You think, I'm a crazy man because of the way I look at the weather. I would probably respond to you the same way with some of the things that you're crazy about. And guess what? Your wife's already done it. Or your husband has already done it. These things that are trying to pull our affections away, are those things that often allow pride to weave their thorny pathway into our relationships with a desire to destroy and break them up. It's important for us to understand in the first uh, 22 to 26 that the position, if you will, in the workplace between John and Jesus, just like it's important for you and I to understand our positions as husband and wife within the relationship, however that works best for you, so that you can best respond biblically in your home, then you need to be able to do that. The position for these guys was John was given a standpoint. This is your ministry. This is your life. This is what you're supposed to do. You're going to lay this pathway out for Jesus. Jesus completely understood his commission as well. But the disciples that were with John had a problem with all of this. They said, hey, we hear Jesus is up there, and he's doing the same thing we're doing, and everybody is coming to him. Now, I don't know how you handle these kinds of things in your relationships. John completely understood where he was going, but his followers said, you know, we're really unhappy with that. Aren't you upset that Jesus is now getting all the glory? How's that work in your relationship? Do you sometimes feel like either your husband or your wife are getting all the glory? Maybe you don't get acknowledged for certain things because of what you do and who you are. Maybe he just doesn't treat you well because you're the person that's handling all kinds of things in the home or maybe with the kids or maybe you handle the finances or maybe you're both working and then she comes home and you're still expecting her to do everything else involved in the house. And he's like... 
hey, I'm just going to put my feet up. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. But I do know that if we don't watch this kind of thing, these distractions weave their way into relationships and they have the potential to separate and ultimately destroy. So it's important that we understand our functions and our role within our home. And you know what? God lays them out biblically for us, but in each one of our houses, things might look slightly different depending on background, depending on personality, depending on current situations that you have going on. And that's okay. As long as we're not violating the biblical mandates of Scripture, then we might see things a little bit differently in how our homes operate. So how are they operating? Has the culture war struck your house as well? And have you allowed certain things to literally penetrate and dive deep into the relationship to build a wedge there? Or are we seeing these things as opportunities? Do we understand our position? Let's take a look at verses 27 and 28. Position in the workplace or in the relationship, and how about pride in the heart? Look at verse 27. John answered and said this, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. Ooh, remember, God is in control of all the blessings. John was going to have none of it. Instead of literally taking in, you know, you might be right on that. Yeah, I'm hearing these voices out there. Yeah, I got my girlfriends calling me, telling me that my husband's a, a deadbeat and he really shouldn't be doing that. And, and I don't really like the way he's treating you. And, and then I got my guy friends over here saying, really, she's doing that? And that's, really? We've got all kinds of competition going out there. What's really going on in your home? Are we really addressing the situations? What are the elephants in the room right now in your house? Now, the elephants in the room are the things that we know are there, but we choose not to talk about them. And they're alive and well. They're huge. But we don't want to step on toes, maybe, and so we, we, we step back. And then there's the elephant in the room that's actually being addressed, and then what we do is we choose not to do anything about it. Maybe we talk about it, and that makes us feel good. Because we've actually brought something up. But when actual change needs to take place or, or situations need to gel more in the relationship, we back off and we say, nah, nah, we're not going to do anything about that. That's a huge problem. That's called pride in the heart. And God wants that slain. John was having none of it. Verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ but I have been sent before him. John saw this as a very teachable moment, not as an opportunity to gain control. I love this. In, in, instead of capitalizing on what his friends were saying and being puffed up in spirit and mind, he reminded them. It's like you and I reminding culture. You and I reminding those around us. Like, no, we didn't sign up for this. This is what God signed us up for. This is why we're married. This is the reason behind this. We're not going to allow culture to come in and destroy what you have laid out. And on top of that, we're not going to allow pride to come in and ruin the beauty and blessing of what God has done by putting us together. And so we've got to look at distractions and pride coming from all different areas. He continues... In verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. This is John talking again. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Listen, this is such a great picture. John says, you know what? Let me, let me give you an illustration that everybody's going to get. Let's bring the wedding situation together. He says, I'm the best man. And the best man's responsibility is to make sure that the wedding goes off like without a hitch. And that the groom is the one who gets all the attention. That's why I'm here. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to allow this to come and to destroy the relationship that we have. My job is to point to him and make him look the way that he needs to be. You know what? When it comes to husband and wife relationships... 
Are we willing to make our spouse look awesome? Barbara and I will never forget a dinner that we were at years ago. We sat down, uh, both of our families, we had young kids, and uh, the husband looks at his wife. We're, we're there sitting down. And he says, well, what's this on the table? Now, could you imagine being that woman? I mean, I could not believe, it probably took all she had to not go over there and slap him across the face. Let me tell you something. You're going to have situations where your wife or your husband, they do not respond or perform or do whatever it takes to match up to the standard that you think should be there. You know what? Every relationship has that. So many times, though, there's going to be wonderful things that happen. You and I need to be in a place where we're building each other up. Where we don't view each other as adversaries or, or in competition towards each other. God has brought us together for such a time as this to move forward in our walk and relationship with each other. How in the world can you build each other up? And when you know that the other messed up or is maybe down instead of kicking them down in order to boost your pride and make yourself look better, how in the world could you reach down and help them and love on them and pick them up? I mean, this is what John was all about. He says, you know what? My joy is fulfilled in being obedient to what I've been called to do. Not in order to make me look better. Not in order for my pride to well up within me. It's for me to make the other person look awesome. That means we take that step back. And man, I tell you, there are times when we do not like to do that. We feel privileged. We feel like we need to be elevated. We feel like the whole situation needs to be about me. We feel like all of our relationship aspects need to be focused on me. And God is showing us through the life of John and Jesus that it's actually the opposite. How can we put a focal point on somebody else? We need to make sure that we leave selfishness at the door. We need to be willing to take the issues that we're wrestling with and we're struggling with and, and lay them out. Yeah, let's talk about it, but then let's do something about it as well. And then finally, he wraps it up with this. In verse 30, what is this priority? He says this, he must increase. Some of your translations use the word, he must become greater. And that's why we did the song. He must be greater and I must be less. He must increase, I must decrease. How do we do this in a relationship? At least several from a worship perspective, private and public, how can God be glorified? From our walk, it's progressive in our growth for him and towards each other. And how about our witness, proclaiming Christ? That's how he becomes greater and greater. How do you do this in your relationship? I don't know. Maybe it looks a little differently in yours than it would in mine. I mean, Barb is so gracious. I mean... Let's face it, I mean, we've only had 14 inches of snow here this year. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's horrible. For a guy like me, I mean, that's Depression City. And so I get up early Monday morning, and I say, are you willing to jump in the car and drive seven hours with me to upstate New York where there is 37 inches of snow on the ground, and we can play around in the snow for 30 hours and then turn right around in the car and come back before the sleet storm comes here? Her response, sure, I'd be glad to do that with you. Now, most people say she's nuts. She's crazy. She could be going off saying, why, why, I mean, we've been married 37 years. Why are you still doing this to me? Why can't you just grow up and get over this kind of thing? No, but I will tell you this. We enjoy being with each other. So if it's sitting in a car for a seven-hour ride and then frolicking around in the snow at minus one and then getting in the car and then driving all the way back, yeah, it works for us. Because she's not looking at it as he's a nutcase. No, this is my husband, and I may think he's a little crazy, but we're going to be able to spend time together. And I love it that she does that. 
How can I? You talk about you talk about filling your tank up. You think the next time that there's an issue or situation that Barb might have, and and she maybe needs my help with something, I'm going to be thinking like, I'm not going to do anything like that. Absolutely not. Our tanks are being full and filled because we enjoy being with each other. And I'll tell you another thing it does. When things don't go as well as you want them to go in your relationship, because the tank is full, it makes the situations that you have to work through less painful. Yeah, you got to work through them, but you got a lot of credit. And you're able to draw from that. And John is telling us here, listen, this whole idea of pride is about making the other person better. It's understanding why we're here, what God has called us to do and called us to be. It's not just this selfish ambition and, and striving so that we can get all the glory. In fact, it's, it's all but the opposite. God has brought you together as husband and wife today because it's his plan. There's personalities involved, and you will go through the pain and suffering of challenges and issues. You will also be struck with levels of pride that God is going to want us to slay on the altar. And the sooner we get that done, the better we can continue to slide on in to the beauty of our relationship. That's what this is all about. And so I love this example of John and Jesus, because not only are they showing us, really, a relationship that we need to have between us and God, but it also literally sheds light on the wonderful, beautiful principles that can exist between husband and wife as well. We have a response. God wants us to respond. He wants us to follow through with what we're hearing. What does that look like in your relationship today? Those of you in here that aren't married, you're thinking about getting married. One day you would like to be there. What is God doing with you through this? How is he going to start talking to you about dealing with pride now so that when you get into those relationships, you're able to navigate and function most effectively in and through those and be an example, maybe by the grace of God, to your future spouse? These principles are far-reaching. Culture says... Don't buy it. It's the Bible. It's old-fashioned. It's for old people like me. But yet God says the Bible is transgenerational. The principles have been here through all of time, and they will be here for eons to come, for your kids, your grandkids, and their kids, unless the Lord returns. So these are principles that we need to love and embrace as professing Christians, because these are the things that are right and true. Culture wants to tell us differently. God has already laid out what the principles are. May he give us strength, grace, and wisdom to embrace them and to love him and to love our spouses as we live them out. Let's pray together. Lord, we are just so grateful to be here today, and we don't come with any pride at all. We come humbly before you, thanking you that you've given us principles to live by in the scriptures. We pray that we would not fall to the, the issues that culture is trying to jam down our throats, but that we would stand true to your word and be able to do it in a way that is loving to those within our community. To say, listen, we're not going to buy that. We see where you're coming from, but we want to stand on you and, and your word, and we want to live these beautiful principles out and we pray for your grace to do it, Lord, not only so that our relationships can function the way you've designed them, but that we can show a world around us who's throwing all of this away, that this is rich and real and true and right. God, help us to be an example to the culture around us, and help us, most importantly, to show you honor and grace and glory, because you are God alone. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we uh, close out our service.
online as well. Enjoy the sunshine rest of the afternoon. Have a fantastic week and look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Thanks. <laughs>